This is a special video preview of the Bob Thurman Podcast and is brought to you in part through the generous support of its listeners and subscribers like you. To learn more, please visit BobThurman.com. Now, podcast number whatever, whatever, I don't know why I do, but I do. Um, it's happening today, which is a marvelous blue moon day, but it's a red blue moon, which is what makes it more far out. Uh, apparently, if we get it at the right moment, we'll see a red reflection just at sundown in some places. And then there is a full eclipse in some places and a partial eclipse in some other places. I think where I am, it happens early in the evening, I believe, from reading in the internet. And I'm going to try to see it because we have a clear sunny day today. And so it's a very auspicious day. If you, during the time of an eclipse, even if you're not seeing it because there's clouds or you're not in the right place, during an eclipse time, it's considered in Buddhist lore, Tibetan Buddhist lore, an Indian Buddhist lore before that, that if you do something virtuous in that time, which doesn't have to be a practice like meditating or saying a mantra, although it could be, or bowing or something, it could be serving food at a soup kitchen, being kind to someone, saying, you know, restraining yourself from being greedy or angry or something like that, or gaining an insight and studying something. But whatever you do is positive impact is multiplied millions of times, they believe. And I think they do that because the sun and the moon are associated in the super subtle Buddhist nervous, the subtle Buddhist nervous system with the right channel, which I think is the Ha channel in, um, or maybe, you know, it's the Ta channel in Hatha yoga. And the left channel is the moon, which I think is the Ha channel. I think, I'm not sure which is which actually in the, in the Indian yoga thing. And um, anyway, one is there to, to each one, sun and moon. So in an eclipse is connected to the central channel, which is when the sun and moon merge their energies in the central channel. And there's therefore a time of great power. So if you do a bad thing in that time, don't rob a bank while the moon is being eclipsed, because then they're really bad taking what is not given to you uh, depriving some other people of beings of property. That's really bad. So don't do anything. Don't be nasty. Be kind. Be loving. And if you are doing practices, then Om Mani Peme Hum, Om Tari Tu Tari Tu Di Swaha, Shri Vajrakota Hari Griva Hulu Hulu Hum Pe, you know, Hristi Vikitana No Hum Pe, some powerful mantra if you say at that time, Om Ahum Ho Hang Samalavara Ya Hum Pe, the kind of chakra one, that it has a tremendously powerful impact. Omar Abadana Di, Omar Abadana Di Di Di, the wisdom genius one. So, um, so that's a very good thing to do. Anyway, so, so anyway, I'm in this mood myself today, and it is especially auspicious day, so I thought I would try to do something auspicious and talk to you about cool heroes. And here I'm referring to a concept I first elaborated in the popular area, which means it probably the first time I thought about it, of um, uh, in my book Inner Revolution, called Cool Heroism, which is the type of heroism practiced by those who are involved in Shakyamuni Buddhas and all the subsequent great Buddhist uh, teachers and students, the cool revolution of changing our world from a world of violence and conflict and ego competition and unhappiness to a world of gentleness and har harmoniousness and um, cooperation and compromise and selfless interaction, meaning, you know, flexible and resilient interaction. It doesn't mean you're not there so you don't interact. Selfless doesn't mean that. It means that you don't have a fixed oppositional point of view to the other person, but you are exchange your own view to them. You're aware of how what you do and you take account their experience of what's what you're doing, what's going on, which makes you automatically compassionate and loving and ethical. And um, it's really a wonderful world. It's called a Buddha world as opposed to Buddhaverse, I call it, instead of a universe. So this theory of cool heroism, I'll just tell an anecdote that I have told different times about when I, when I was promoting that book and doing book tour and traveling in those days, you, you did them. And uh, I... Um, at one point, someone challenged me and said, well, this is great about all this cool heroism and how this ultimately will triumph over hot heroism 
when we have an enlightenment party here, in, an awake party here in the U.S., which I think we will. Um, uh, but uh, please, t where's all the cool heroes now? All we can see is Rambos, you know, you know, angry people, even people who are aggrieved and seeking justice, the oppressed people, they are doing so with anger. And they feel they need the anger to get fight back against the oppression of the angry oppressor and so on. So that seems to be the only shot. And in, in war, even soldiers go attack the enemy, hating them and wanting to destroy them. And they do transcendental things sometimes, of bravery is giving their, sacrificing their lives and so forth. So we, we know the power of hot heroism. So where's these cool heroes? And you know, uh, and answering it, of course, I would, Martin Luther King, Gandhi, Dalai Lama, uh, even the whole Tibetan people reacting mostly, not entirely the whole, I'd say the majority of the Tibetan people, reacting nonviolently to a genocidal invasion, occupation, and oppression, and annexation. Uh, but uh, I can point to those examples and many others, Cesar Chavez and so forth. But that person wouldn't have been satisfied. So I was sort of thinking, suddenly I had an image, maybe from my youth, maybe a little bit from my own family, of a household temper, temp tantrum fight, you know, quarrel, of, you know, especially the males, and father-son, or sometimes brother-brother, Sometimes brother, sister, but often, usually, more often, brother, brother. And uh, I was one of three brothers in my youth family, and I have three sons in our, my own family. And uh, I had a vision of that. And in visions of that, I suddenly noticed, in the flashing memories, as I was trying to think of an answer for this guy, I noticed that the women are the ones uh, uh, who calm things down. They're the ones who step in between the combatants. They're, or if it's just verbal, they tell them, they, oh, you didn't really mean that, dear. Oh, you really don't think that about your brother. No, no, you really don't hate your dad. Oh, no, you don't hate your son. Or whatever, you know. They are in there. And then if sometimes in some, you know, there's so much domestic violence in America and in the world, actually, terrible amount, really, these huge, dramatic, you know, life-destroying uh, domestic violence, Often the, that woman takes the blows. You know, maybe the males attend them for each other. Or, you know, some male is, you know, domestic violence, I think, if some male is frustrated with the competitiveness of society and it feels they're losing, then they take it out, they drink, and then take it out on the female. So I suddenly realized, wait a minute, why am I worried about identifying cool heroes? The women of the planet are the cool heroes, and it's half the population of the planet, at least. And except in some weird countries where they get rid of female babies because they're obsessed with having sons. And sadly and wrongly. And uh, so there you have lots of cool heroes in the sense that their bravery and their courage comes through gentleness and but persistence and courage in the line of fire but responding non-violently, usually. Occasionally, they, they are forceful if some of the hot people are going to do something truly destructive to each other or to them, something they might be forceful themselves, but not out of hatred, out of wishing to prevent a greater, a greater violence, usually. I mean, of course, nothing, no, no generalization is absolute. I'm not claiming, claiming that. So they, those females, are the cool heroes. And then this leads into a broader thing. In, the, in those days, I think I wrote an article on the Vagina Monologue book of Eve Ensler about... Uh, how there is a kind of level in the Buddhist tantrism of the worship of the vagina as the source of life. It's considered the, the door of liberation even. You know, the three corners of the downward pointing triangle that is a symbol of that source of, you know, birthplace as it's called, source of birth, source of creativity, is uh, emptiness, emptiness, uh, wishlessness, and and um, uh, uh, signlessness, which are a little technical to explain, but they basically are sort of the doorway to ultimate reality. And that's, of course, very high advanced esoteric thing, but I did write that for her, and I've always I have felt that. And also my own wife is my cool hero, who is my guru, uh, equally to any of my lamas, really, uh, in, in dealing day-to-day -day with the day-to-day, bit-by-bit, baby-step, character correction, character improvement, deepening of insight, 
restraint of negativities and so forth, that is actually the living meditation of Buddhism in the midst of life, which is the most important one. And the one done on the seat in isolation and withdrawal from the world is only to prepare for being able to keep that, that loving, patient, non-reactive uh, uh, meditation going in the midst of activity. That's the real challenge, and that's the real nirvana, is real nirvana with other people, not just uh, some fantasized nirvana in some isolated state, which doesn't really exist, actually, but which Buddha clearly taught, even to those he let think there was a way out of the world. The way out of the world is just the way out of the world of ignorant ego conflict into a world of love and cooperation and selfless cooperation. The Buddhaverse, not the universe. The universe is the, I'm the one. Buddhaverse is we're all awake together. You know? And it doesn't mean that, and actually I'm more happy in that you know, we, every I, every one, every ego is still there. It isn't destroyed. It's just not uniquely focused on itself. It's open to others that there are others with egos and therefore learns to dance with them. And so that's really the way that it should be. So... So nowadays the vanguard, I think, and it's now, now we're in the time of the Me Too movement, of the Time's Up movement. Uh, we saw the defeat of our first woman president uh, through chicanery and cheating. Actually, she actually did win, so we can take heart that we were smart enough to vote her in a majority to win against a few guys who are trying to run back to the old, you know, gun-toting, uh, mutually destructive uh, mutual assured destruction world, and um, so she was defeated, although she won. Uh, like Al Gore was, if it, there was a case of two males, Al and W, and Al won too, and was defeated by cheating, and that time just homegrown cheating, and the more important cheating may have been homegrown, even in this case, not just Mr. Putin, but I think they, they helped, the homegrown one. So we had just lost that, so then this gave our cool heroes, the, the idea that they should take their coolness and they should magnify and intensify it and not just be complacent and passive, too passive, and should be actively cool heroes. And that's what they are. And, you know, the heroism, for example, and what is meant by cool there is the gentleness. The heroism is a mass demonstration, maybe 20, 30 million people marching on the day of the women's protest, day after the inauguration of our poor, unsuited the fellow who is, you know, having to try to do the job that he's not equipped for or qualified for. And, uh, but in that forceful thing, showing their disapproval, they were wearing pussy hats, which they knitted, which is a symbol of gentleness, actually. And, uh, of course, it's, it's, it's like offering a lot of things to grab for somebody who breast boasted how he liked to grab them. So it has a tremendously humorous, teasing thing, which just drove him mad, of course. Poor fellow, you know. But uh, still, it's a symbol of gentleness and pe pleasure and bliss and happiness, actually. You know, not, 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 not aggression and anger, you know. You know, you can't hold, a, a, like, an AK-47 and shoot it with your pussy. Not possible. Uh, at, least, at least not yet. <laughs> not, not, in, not to our knowledge, let's say. So... So uh, here's the thing. This is what we should be celebrating today. And we should magnify this celebration and we should persist in it. And this cool heroism taking an active role in politics. You know, nobody could cheat the will of the majority is still in our nearly lost democracy, our oligarchically, you know, perverted democracy with the, because of Citizens United and a corrupt Supreme Court and so forth an irrational one, nobody could still cheat, even with all of that bad situation, if 80% plus of everybody voted. And uh, even if 30, therefore, even if 30 or 40% vote the wrong way, the vi go, going backwards way, the violence, regressive way, the exclusionary way, the mean, blue meanie type of way, uh, if 80% voted, uh, over 80% voted, they would be outvoted. No way. There will never will be such a percentage anyway who will vote. It's usually only 25 to 28% that defeats a less than 50% vote turnout. So the good guys are less than that 28%. So we really need to, this, this is a time, it's like, a, it's like the time in the Star Trek movie 
where they saved the whales, I forget the title, you know, where Spock and everybody went back in the Klingon ship. They traveled back in time to get a whale and bring it to the future part of the planet to save the planet from a weird alien destruction with Doomsday Machine. And in that wonderful movie, uh, now I lost track. I got into Star Trek. Uh, uh, what was I saying? Whales, cool heroes, saving. Oh, yeah, no, no. Yeah, in order to go back in time, they had to use the gravity field of the sun to slingshot that Klingon ship into a super powerful uh, speed because it was through into the fancy, you know, the sci-fi fantasy of the film was that this super beyond warp speed, you know, beyond whatever speed warp speed was necessary to move in time as well as space. So they went back and forth through time by using that. So we should use today, although I don't know if this will be aired today, I, I doubt it in a way, but, you know, retroactively we should think that we are using today to slingshot all the way to November, whatever it is, 8th, 6th, 3rd, whatever day, whatever is the first Tuesday in November, and, the, and longer and shorter days in sensible states that still have longer voting periods, to everyone get out and vote. And then there's no doubt the right result will occur, which means that the will of the majority, the will of most of the people, will, will prevail. And the, the rational, scientific, realistic way of behaving and performing the job and resuming the mantle of nonviolent, soft power leadership, democratic leadership that this planet so desperately needs, this work can then begin in 2018. We don't have to wait to 2020 because the, our other poor, suffering, Trumpy, Trumpus Americanus, actually, there's a wonderful children's book about the Trumpus Americanus. I read to my granddaughter the other day about this creature called a Trumpus who was, who was Trumping, but was really in a very uncomfortable position, being angry with everyone and nobody really liking that Trumpus. It was really an unhappy Trumpus. And it is an unhappy Trumpus. And once we get the House, even the House back, and preferably both House and Senate, in spite of all the gerrymandering and the cheating, we can get them back, definitely, if 80-plus percent vote, or even maybe 75 percent would be enough. And then he will be happy to re be relieved of duty. He will not even seek any kind of procedure to relieve him. He will happily go back to Mar-a-Lago full-time and his penthouse full-time. Without be He'll still be followed by a little security because he'll be an ex-president, he won't be impeached, accused of a crime. He'll just go back to living, living in his other ways of seeking pleasure and wealth, which is his main quest. And he will bother much fewer people, you know. And we'll correct a lot of the exaggerations in the different tax things and immigration bills and destruction of agency, like destroying all our national parks by Mr. Zinke uh, in, the, in the Interior Department. And a lot of things that are really very destructive that are going on today, you know, that will be corrected. And um, in a way, then we can have actually thank the Trumpus Americanus for all the suffering he has undergone because he suffers every day, all the time. All these tweets come out of a deep well of dissatisfaction, misery, and anger himself, which is very uncomfortable for him to have to sustain and unhealthy, too. The, the, he's very strong physically, must be, to have that, you know, cortisol flood going in his circulatory system all the time, you know, which relates to anger, you know, and bile, you know, it's just terrible, turning him orange, you know, like a, like a hepatitis victim, you know. It's really, one has to be compassionate, you know, and, uh, and that doesn't mean not try not to stop the destructiveness, but one has to be compassionate. So, and we will do that by the women making sure to get out there, getting grandma out there, and then grandma bringing grandpa out there to the voting thing, and going ahead of time, and getting the ID, and joining up, and supporting the women candidates, and running for office, and speaking common sense fearlessly and courageously and humorously to the people, and, uh, 
and, and bringing up their enthusiasm as they beautifully can do and do do all the time. But this time, not just in the coffee shop, not just at the dinner table, not just in the middle of the household brawl, not just in the whatever, but everywhere, the PTA meeting, in the church, uh, you know, parent meeting, in the, you know, in the, you know, in the election meeting, especially, you know, in 2018. This we, we fervently pray, and this is our slingshot time to really visualize that and imagine it and work for it and be inspired about it. Because this absolutely must happen this time. The world really cannot take the abuse of more coal dust poured into it. And coal miners is not really such a nice job. There's no reason why the younger and talented ones cannot have really fine jobs with a proper plan that like Hillary had, where she was going to put, you know, training and computer uh, literacy and all sorts of things in all West Virginia and where Eastern Kentucky and Eastern Tennessee and Western uh, and Western ordinary Virginia and North Carolina and so on, easily put it there anywhere where there are those mines and really turn those communities not to be dependent. And of course, there still will be some coal, but you know, it's and then make the owners, you know, get their workers out of harm's way any of the ones that are left, and make real safety and really follow OSHA guidelines and revive OSHA guidelines, which are no doubt trashed by whoever's misrunning OSHA under, under the Trumpets. And, uh, you know, she, with that plan can be, will be implemented. The House has the money, they will implement it, if we have the House, with a solid majority in it, definitely. So this is really, really important, and it's a Dharma practice. Now, someone told me the other day that they were at some meeting about Buddhist activism, and that a lot of them were saying, well, I don't really want to be activist, I want to meditate, and I don't think I should be activist, that, you know, really as a Buddhist I should be sitting and meditating. And here, we have to, I have to say something, this is completely uh, not correct. And uh, even if you're meditating, you have to be meditating as an activist. In other words, what is your motive in meditating? You know, even though you learn techniques from Theravada traditions, which is very good, it's really too late in history to have a Therav only a Theravada motivation, which means seeking only your own personal enlightenment. By think because not because you're selfish, but because you're thinking or you're taught. That you can't be a Buddha and you and you can only be like a saint, an arhat, and you can only get free from this world, which is all bad and can't really be saved, and you're just going to escape into nirvana, which is somewhere else, which is an unfortunate sort of interpretation of the type of teaching Buddha gave to some of the monks some of the time. He also, to the highly developed ones, he gave them the universal vehicle, which I call it, I never call it the lesser vehicle, I call it the, the individual vehicle. And it's good to teach the individual that, who wouldn't be able to imagine taking on the whole responsibility for everyone, while they're still trying to make themselves more responsible and more awake. So that's understandable. But, you know, Buddha did it on purpose, actually. He did clearly say, if you read between the lines, he clearly said there is no such place apart from the world where you can go to escape. That's a psychotic projection of your sense that your real self is somewhere disconnected from your relative body and, and relative mind. You know, it's a, it's a projection of the fundamental distortion of ignorance and egotism and misknowing and misknowledge that the real me is some fixed thing apart from all, all the me that I can actually relatively relate to. And yet that's where I really am. So uh, nirvana outside is, or liberation or moksha outside is a projection and a sort of wish to withdraw away from all the bothersome interactions with, with basically painful others who are always annoying and irritating and so on. And uh, he knew it would be too much for them to realize that the goal is already here, actually. That our reality is that there is no separate entity inside ourself. We have a self, but it's a changeable flexible, resilient, interactive self, only relative. There's no absolute self that is separate from the relative self. That's our delusive ignorance that causes all the problematic nature of our unawake life. And uh, so to pretend that the nirvana is realizing that which is described as the primal error 
It's, of course, simple to not do, but it's normal that people who are too self-deprecative, they think they don't have the ability, they think they can't stand it, they think they, they can't deal with the people around the corner and the neighbor or whatever, or the wife or the child, usually males, actually, upper-class males, usually, and in Buddha's time, Brahmins, you know, and warriors, dominant males in a patriarchal society. They can't really think that. So they would, be, they would just be either overwhelmed or dismissive if the Buddha said to them, well, if you knew where you were at right now, you're in Nirvana. And if you behave in a loving manner, then it's as good as be feeling you're in Nirvana. And if you keep doing that and you cultivate the ability to do that totally, you will actually feel that you're in the Nirvana, even still dealing with the issue. And you'll be realizing then and you'll be automatically and spontaneously and without effort want your, your happiness and, and relief of being in Nirvana in the midst of it all will automatically overflow to everyone else around you. And so you will naturally sort of be caring for them and responsible for them and you will become a Buddha and uh, not just a, just a self-liberated saint. You'll become a liberating, liberated but also liberating Buddha. Definitely. So they would have been overwhelmed by that. But he did tell those male Brahmin monk disciples who in this first early order, some of them, he told them this other one that everything is here now, it's all non-dual, Nirvana, Samsara, and all this, the deeper, more logical teaching and more magnificent envision teaching and more realistic teaching. And he did. And then, very importantly, because of his master strategy of how to ripen a planet full of beings, he told them, don't spread this around. It was like esoteric. He said, don't spread it around to the whole society right away. At this time, you know, sixth century before the Common Era, when there are city-states vying for empire, you know, and a lot, a lot of violence and war and things, and uh, don't spread it around because people will misuse this idea that everything is nirvana, or they won't believe it, or they'll be, over, uh, be overwhelmed by it. So don't spread it around. About 400 or 500 years from now, after people have steeped themselves in the skills, the mind skills, the psychology, the wisdom, the, the wisdom of reality of the individual vehicle as individuals and have become more truly and proudly and confidently individualistic and not just part of a kind of patriarchal collective uh, society, extended family society, then it will be safe to expand this universal vehicle teaching and the non-dual teaching. And so then so I, I will have a a future emanation or follower or actually someone who was alive at the time who was a citizen of the city of Vaishali, people say, the Tibetans say, uh, with, with someone with Naga in his name will, will arise and will rediscover uh, this as a teaching I want you to keep esoteric. I want you to entrust it to the Nagas uh, and keep it away from the human Indian uh, civilized literate world for about four or five hundred years. He said that. Uh, and of course, you know, because he was a super sociologist as well as a super psychologist, a super physicist, a super biologist, and an awakened, fully awakened person who had a master strategy that is still playing itself out today and which we are, we are seeing the fruits of today in our wild world. But it's a wild world where we're all so much more interconnected than we even were 40 years ago. That, that our sense of being a relational, interactive being with infinite or countless other interactive beings is much more intense than it has ever been in the last few thousand years of history. And um, there may be a hand in the wisdom angels, you know, through, you know, associated with Shakyamuni, who may be able to have a hand in working on that, but that is too elaborate to get into more today. And the point is, it doesn't rep depend on Buddhism. You know, Buddhism doesn't own reality. It, reality is a certain way, as discovered by Buddha, and other people have discovered it in their own way as well. And then they, but then their cultures do not have the sophistication, scientific sophistication that Buddha's culture did, and uh, which this was kept alive for 1,500 years in, in India, and then the last thousand in Tibet. And uh, may, really, mainly a little bit Mongolia, a little bit the other Buddhist countries, but mainly in those central countries, 
free from the colonialists and the violence and the stuff that was going on in the other countries where they have equal power between the armies and the monasteries, where this is where it's all monastic universities. India, I mean, Tibet, India, Tibet, and Mongolia became for periods of time, which we lost sight of because not having military, they ended up being wrecked like they have been lately. But their teaching is not wrecked. Their people's hearts are not wrecked, those who have not been slaughtered and taken rebirth. And uh, their, their message and their, and their wisdom and kindness and compassion is not wrecked. Just look at the Dalai Lama and his colleagues and you will see people who are not wrecked in spite of what would be major wreckage to a lesser persons. So, so this is what we must think about today, about awakening the planet. There's a, you know, it's wonderful in America, the beautiful black people in America, their slang you know, is also something really wonderful. They have this concept of being awoke, <laughs> which means being more conscious of what people like to be in denial about. And that's precisely enlightenment, you know, being awoke or awakened, you know, and the Buddha means awoke or awakened. And uh, it means transcending racism as well as sexism and transcending, you know, uh, uh, nationalism and religious fanaticism and intolerance and uh, all kinds of in-group and out-group uh, things, you know. It means transcending those things, this knowledge. In reality, it's not realistic to go extremist in any of these sort of concepts and notions and ideologies and things. It's not realistic. There are better and worse ideologies, but the better ones are always the more open-minded ones, the ones that are self-confident because they're sensible and reasonable. The ones that are based on irrationality and blind faith and, and no common sense, against common sense even, uh, they tend to be more extremist because people feel more insecure about holding them. So then they get all fanatic about it and another person's not holding the view, feels challenging to them because of their insecurity. And then they even can be violent, lethally violent, you know, inquisitions, you know, auto da fe's, you know, pursuance of heretics, you know, burnings at the stake, concentration camps for people who are, who like the communists have done in history about people who insist on being religious, and so on. So, anyway, let's not stay with the negative, only the positive in the spirit of the cool heroes. And let us pray for them, and let us support them, and we men, who are trying our best to get over our harassing attitudes and our harassing behaviors and our harassing history and our harassing hormones even, we have to learn to restrain them and to, to rechannel them and to be gentle and to be reverend and to share burdens and to be aware, uh, aware, aware and awake in a new way. And it doesn't mean we have to be, it's good for us to be subservient actually to our female partners uh, or, and friends to compensate to somewhat. But the ultimate goal, of course, is partnership, equality. And here I recommend to everyone the great Rihanna Eisler, whose book, The Chalice and the Blade, popularizes a discovery in history that upends the notion, the mythology that is taught in our militarized societies, that, that man has always been violent and a hunter and violence is essential to survival, all this, which is really wrong. And we can survive much better now. In fact, violence is self-destructive totally. War is no longer possible. It's uh, the winner is, destroys themselves inevitably the way the power of the, our genius creating the weapons is. So we have to learn the skill of not exploding in violence to, as a solution to situations. We have to learn that. And then we can be partners with, our, with the better haves, you know, with our higher selves you know, our beloved uh, women and daughters and mothers and grandmothers and wives and friends. And women don't really enjoy having five babies. They don't even enjoy having one baby, actually. They actually having it. They enjoy loving it, of course. And that, that power of that love overcomes the lack of enjoyment of having. But, uh, so therefore they wouldn't have more than necessary if they had their say. As you know, population spikes always occur where women are downtrodden and have no say. And where they start to have a say, like look at Scandinavia, 
they practically have to pay a good Swedish woman to have a, have a kid, you know, uh, rather than just sort of automatically expect them to do it for, with no compensation, which is the way in societies where women are no good. But everyone should be free to do anything. That's spiritually important. Okay, so happy blue, red moon day. It's kind of auspicious, you know, blue is associated with liberals and red is associated with conservatives. And actually true conservatives should be as horrified by the radical destructiveness of what's currently going on by just the misplacement of people, unqualified people, and the release of pure pure addictive hatred and greed by these unqualified people who are just crashing around like bulls in china shops so drew conservative like conservatives created the national parks they don't want to see them destroyed and turn into slag heaps so that's a true conservative so true liberals are associated with, true conservatives associated with the red true liberals associated with the blue the moon is teaching us today that red and blue can merge and it's a purple situation, or it can be just back and forth, red and blue, no, no problem, red and blue. And um, actually in Buddhist symbolism, red is more symbolic of the female and blue of the male, actually, rather than people might think because Hillary was blue, who, that, that's the opposite. But Buddhist one, the red is because red stands for the ovum, you know, for blood, the blood energy, which is the female special province of that river of life and the male is the sort of semen and whatever and, and blueness is a male tendency when they're feeling sad and lonely as they often do okay so lots of luck and blessing we have to say it to this moon This video was originally recorded on February 1st, 2018 in Woodstock, New York.